Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship at home here at DeWitt Community Church as we continue the practice of social distancing in order to combat the spread of the coronavirus. As we meet as a virtual community, there are a few opportunities of connection in the life of our church that I want to share with you. As always, your pastoral staff is available by phone. Please don't hesitate to use the pastor on call line if there's any way we can be helpful to you or your family, and that number is on our website. We've started a new study via Zoom called You'll Get Through This, which is a six-week study that is discussion and video-based that I am leading. It meets on Sundays at 10 a.m. If you're interested in joining the study, you can contact the church office or email the church office at office at dewittchurch.org. We've heard from some of you that you're connecting and sharing our worship with your family and friends. And you can go to our website, www.dewickchurch.org, to get connected to our Facebook page for online worship and music and devotionals and interactive materials. Lastly, we're encouraging the congregation, if able, to continue to be generous in their giving and their donations. We are still doing the work of God in ministry virtually, and we need your support. You can give at our website, give.dewittchurch.org, or send a check to the church directly. This is normally in the time in our worship service where we greet one another, and since we're practicing social distancing, we encourage you to reach out to a friend or a neighbor and let them know that you're thinking about them and that you care. You can also call someone who might be isolated or alone and lift them up in prayer. Today in our worship of God, we explore the resurrection account of Jesus to the disciples and consider how this wounded, healed, and resurrected Christ can teach us about our own journey of healing from life's tragedies and struggles. Our opening hymn is Christ is Alive. I encourage you to join in and sing. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship. As we begin this time, let's join together in our responsive psalm and chorus. Um, because this is a time where there's not uh, physical presence here for the congregation, we invite you to join in all of the text. You'll see it says all, so just feel free to join in uh, responding with us. Christ
Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Christ alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Stop. Will you join with me as we pray together as a community of faith? Lord God, we come to you as we're gathered all around this community and even around the world. As we gather for online worship, we also gather for online prayer. We bring together our thoughts and our concerns, our joys and our challenges before you. And we open ourselves to you as we pray, as we communicate with you. Lord God, we each find ourselves in challenging circumstances, unknown territory, uncharted territory, times of uncertainty and fear. But Lord, we know that even as we walk through these difficult times that you are with us, that you watch over us, that you care for us, that you love us. So we pray that you continue to give us a sense of hope and courage, of optimism as we move through this time. Lord, this morning we pray for those members of our congregation who are in need of your prayers. We pray for Hugh and for Jack, for Leah, Janice, Louise, Morgan, Tim, Paula, Jackie, Bruce, Abriella, Carolyn. Lord, we pray for those families that are grieving the loss of a loved one for the family of Bert Mercero and Ed Klockian, for the family of Floyd and Maureen Moon. We pray that you would give them a special sense of comfort and hope as they go through this time of grief. And now, Lord, as we come to you, we lift up our own silent concerns and celebrations. Please hear us now as we pray to you in this time of silence. And now we pray together that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I was wondering if you ever use one of these, a straw, when you drink your drink. If you use a straw, you do sometimes blow bubbles into your drink. And that's what I used to do a lot when I was little. I love to blow bubbles in my drink, but sometimes it causes me problems because the bubbles pour outside of the water, outside of the, the container. Do you know why the bubbles get into your water? It's because of your breath. So let's pretend that you have a drink like I have today. 
And let's see what happens when I blow into the bottle. It's just a bottle of water, so you don't have to worry about it too much. And let's pretend you have a straw like this too. What do you think is going to happen when I blow this straw into this big bottle of water and bubbles come out? Let's see. <gasps> exactly what I used to get into trouble for. Did you see that? I made a huge mess. Blowing into the water makes the water come out, and it's the breath that makes the bubbles. And that's when I get myself into trouble. The air in your lungs makes the bubbles in the water and pushes out all of the liquid all over the place, like it did with this bottle. But thank goodness I had a bowl underneath it, although it didn't catch all the water I wanted it to. Last week we celebrated on Easter Sunday that Jesus raised from the dead. We called it Resurrection Sunday. And in this week's Bible study, we're going to hear Pastor Allen talk a little bit about preaching the continuation of that Easter story. We'll hear about how Jesus went to the disciples and had his first real interaction with them after he rose from the tomb. It seems like the disciples were really, really afraid. They weren't expecting to see Jesus since the last time they saw him, he had died. And the disciples were afraid also because they were worried that the people that wanted to hurt Jesus would come and hurt them as well. So they stayed in one place together. So in under, order to understand what happened, I want us to pretend that the disciples' fear is like the water that was in this jar. The disciples were laying low out of fear, and so they were still like the water was still. But a little bit later in the story, when Jesus came to them, he breathed on them God's spirit, and he breathed it into their lives. And just like I breathed the air into the water of this bottle, Jesus breathed the air into the disciples. God's Holy Spirit was pushing out the fear the disciples felt and then replacing it with, with joy. The disciples who had had fear because they were scared and worried now were overjoyed and that they weren't scared anymore because they didn't understand, they understood now what had happened. They really understood how Jesus came back to life. But when Jesus breathed that Holy Spirit into them, their fear was replaced by something much more. The same thing is true of us today. I know we're going through some difficult times that might be scary, and maybe you're not sure what's going on. You might be filled with fear about everything. But instead of being fearful, remember today's story. We can remember that when we're filled with God's Holy Spirit and when God breathes into us, we're invited into God's lives, and he takes over our lives. With every breath we breathe, we're inviting God into our lives, and we're also pushing out that fear and that worry that can fill us up sometimes. So when you feel scared or afraid or uncertain about what's happening in life today, I just want you to stop and take a deep breath. Breathe in through your mouth, fill up your lungs, and then breathe out. And remember that same breath that you just took is like God's Holy Spirit filling you up with peace and God's Spirit can live in you so you don't have to worry anymore. Can we pray together? Dear God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you that he gives us abilities and gifts, and we thank you that he can take away our fears by filling us with his Holy Spirit. Fill us today and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have thine own way.
Our scripture text this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 20. This is the account of Jesus appearing to disciples immediately after the resurrection. And I want you to pay attention to how Jesus comes to the disciples and to Thomas. We read from John's Gospel. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, With the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let us pray. Lord, open our ears to hear your word. Open our minds so that we can understand. And open up our hearts to receive your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For these last weeks during coronavirus, my whole life and my family's life has changed. Not only do I have to be a father, husband, parent, friend, and minister. But now I have a whole new range of titles and experiences that I can put on my resume. I can now claim that I am an educator specializing in in in-home learning by setting up Zoom calls for my kids. 
physical education instructor who honed his skills in bike riding and piggyback rides, sous chef who perfected the art of scrambled eggs and popcorn, automotive mechanic specializing in refueling my vehicle only once per month, Amazon specialization buyer, I'm an expert in finding ways to lump an order together in the most efficient way possible. I'm also a conflict negotiator, able to settle differences in who gets to eat the last piece of cake after dinner. And finally, toilet paper finder and researcher who can scour the stores for that elusive product. In this time of coronavirus, we are discovering new jobs and roles in a novel and uncharted world of Zoom, online ordering, and wearing masks and gloves in public. As we spend more time at home, and sometimes more time than we're used to with our families, our lives have been painfully disrupted. Not since September 11, 2001, has our way of life changed so much. We are in a stay-in-place time. There's no dining out, no school for the kids or college students, home confinement, fearful of going out to the store for some of us to even get just basic needs. People are unemployed or furloughed. People are afraid, fearful of sickness and what might come next. What is our comfort? Netflix? Mac and cheese? Xbox? We wonder, will things ever return to normal? Will things be this difficult for this foreseeable future? If we do return to normal, we ask, will it ever really be normal? For others, it's how long will the path of healing and recovery take? How can we move on from such disruptive times. Many find themselves at the end of their rope. Maybe you're feeling this way this morning. In our scripture text, we find the disciples in Jesus' story in a stay-in-place situation, much like us during coronavirus. John chapter 20, verse 19, states that the disciples were utterly afraid. The disciples are fearful of venturing out. They dare not go outside of their house, outside the confines of safety. They're scared of what might happen to them since it was the leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the ruling elders, who took Jesus away to hand over to the Roman officials to be crucified. Would they be taken and beaten? Would they have to endure the humiliation that Jesus suffered? They all had to painfully watch their rabbi, master, and Lord suffer and be put to death. The movement that they were leading was finished. Jesus was in the tomb. They didn't know what to do. These disciples were all cooped up in a house. No doubt that they were at the end of their ropes. Have you ever found yourself at the end of your rope in life? Whether it's during this coronavirus or a personal crisis, or the disciples hold up in their house in fear. We have all had times where we find ourselves there at the end of our rope in life. We have a time in our life when the, the ground shakes and, and everything changes before our eyes. Sometimes we feel like the rug is pulled out from our feet when we're unexpectedly let go from our job. Maybe a friend betrays us. Or perhaps we find ourselves in grief when a loved one dies. Many years ago, a friend of mine from high school found himself at the end of his rope. I'll call him Aiden. He came from a regular family, played sports, and was just a typical teenager. But he once confessed a shocking part of his life that many of us didn't know. He describes his wounded life in this way. 
I was 20 years old in the midst of a multi-year bender that consisted of everything. And I had just dropped out of college, had my license removed, was put into alcohol classes, was consuming and slinging the drug of the everyday, had numerous run-ins with the law, my legal fees were rising, I was on probation and violated it, had over 250 hours of community service issued, and according to my parole officer, was one strike away from jail time. But Aiden's story didn't end there. It was in a moment of isolation and at the end of his rope that things began to change. Aiden continues his story this way. I moved in with my dad to distance myself from distractions and at a step of the environment around me that I wasn't mature enough to handle. For the next few months, it became clear God was trying to get my attention. It seemed everywhere I turned, there was a message that he was trying to get to me. I began attending church with my dad. I didn't necessarily like all of this. I had ignored the faith for years prior to this. I often begrudgingly attended church that I would visit with my dad on weekends. I never aspired to be one of those church boys or Jesus fans. But everything shifted on that Easter Sunday in 2002. In the back of an auditorium, seated next to my brother, listening to the most amazing rendition of My Redeemer Lives, I embraced what I had been denying for years and accepted Christ. Aiden's story, and many others like it, display the truth about God on the path of healing, which Christian author and professor John Claypool describes that we believe in God, the ingenious alchemist. Alchemy, of course, is that misguided belief in history that one substance, such as lead, could be changed into another in the form of gold or other precious material. God possesses the gift that eludes alchemists. This one God we believe in, who according to St. Paul, gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That this God is all alone in the world in having this ingenuity. God has the ability to take bad things and events and resourcefully bring good out of them. Like my friend Aidan learned, God had transformed his painfully disoriented life to being joyfully reoriented into a new way, a new path of healing. Not that God desired Aidan to experience this path of self-destruction, but God was able to show up, transform his life, and redeem his pain and suffering. In the post-resurrection account of John's Gospel, the disciples likewise go from being painfully disoriented from the shackles of fear and reoriented into joy when Jesus appears and declares that peace be with them. Not only did Jesus come to give peace, but also gave the Holy Spirit that very abiding, sustaining, and transformative presence of God to reorient them into the next stage of their life. However, not all the disciples were present. Much has been made of Thomas's absence and his doubts that skeptics call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas has been called a doubter because he needed to see the marks, the, the suffering, the proof of the resurrection. And he says, unless I see the nail marks and put my finger where they are and my hand on his side, I'm not going to believe. I don't think Thomas was an absolute doubter. But instead, he wants to experience what God, the ingenious alchemist, has done. 
when Jesus appears again in verse 26, Thomas is present. Jesus pronounces peace to the disciples, turns to Thomas, and says, put your hands here. See my hands. See my side. Thomas wanted the full experience of what redemption God had done in the rising of Jesus Christ, as did the other disciples. But perhaps Thomas was on to something. Why would God send Jesus back wounded, healed, displayed scars of his suffering and death? God could have done anything. God could have made Jesus' body perfectly healed, unblemished. Christian author Father Richard Rohr helps us understand the wounded and healed, resurrected Jesus this way. Thomas and the resurrected Jesus, he writes, is not really a story about the doubts of the resurrection, but a story about believing that someone could be wounded and resurrected at the same time. Jesus came back wounded, healed, and resurrected to show us what the path of healing our pain, suffering, and doubt really looks like with God. Thomas highlights what this God, the ingenious alchemist, wants us to know. In life, God is waiting there at the end of of our ropes. When we wonder, will things ever return to normal? Will things be this difficult for the foreseeable future? If we do return to normal, will it ever really be normal? How can we move on from such times? Just when the disciples thought all was lost, when they were at the end of their ropes, and just about to give up, that's when Christ appears. That is the moment God appears to us, the wounded, in order to heal and resurrect our lives. God is always waiting at the end of our ropes, waiting to transform us, but only when we, like Thomas, surrender to belief and trust in our divine wounded healer. Our faith is unique because a wounded healer in the form of Jesus Christ became God, died, and was erected, not for God's sake, but for ours. It is in those moments when we are at our wit's end and we think everything is bleak and hopeless. God appears and begins to transform our pain into something new whether it's the disorientation of the coronavirus, job loss, divorce, addiction, conflict in our marriages, or moving on from a painful relationship, God appears when we least expect it. Look at what God teaches us about starting on the path of healing. If the disciples started being painfully disoriented by Jesus' loss, and are now surprisingly reoriented seeing Jesus alive, healed, and living into a new reality and purpose. We can achieve such transformation with our pain, suffering, doubts, and struggle. My friend Aidan and his story show us just how close he is to his painful past. He never lost memory of it. He has a wound in his life, and it was open and unhealthy. But now that wound is healed, and all that remains is a healed scar in his life. And he's living life anew, a life that's been resurrected. If God can turn around my friend's life, God can turn around your life if you find yourself at the end of your rope and you're willing to let God in. May you remember that in life, the worst things are not the last things. For God always has the final redemptive path to offer you. 
May you remember this. If God can make the things that are our out of the things that are our not, then God can make dead things come to life again. And who are we to set limits? Who are we to set limits on our God? The ingenious alchemist can do. Let us pray. God, we ask this week that Your Spirit will journey and be with us. The same Spirit that Jesus breathed on the disciples. Giving them all of the strength. All of the encouragement. Helping them go from being painfully disoriented to being surprisingly reoriented into joy. God, in this time that is uncertain, lift us up. God, when we're at the end of our rope, may we meet you there, ready to change and resurrect our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join with us as we conclude our service with our final hymn. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God you are born into this world. By the grace of God you've been kept all the day long, even unto this very hour. And by the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you and I are being redeemed.